Hi, everybody. Welcome to Cannabis Coast to Coast News Special Report 1v1. I'm PCM founder Jimmy Young, and I'm so happy to be joined by someone that I already have a ton of respect for because he grew up with a guy that I know and used to root for as a sports fan in New England. And uh, first of all, his name is Sean Kiernan, and he is the president of the Weed for Warriors Project. But uh, the way I got to know this guy is that Christian Fourier, uh, who played for the Patriots, was in media in Boston for many, many years uh, as a sports talk show host, introduced us as soon as he found out, Christian found out, that I was in the media world of cannabis. And he said, you should talk to this guy. He's known as the cannabis reporter. So, so Sean, you got a lot to live up to. That's all I could say. Hey, I appreciate it. Christian's a great friend. We've been going to school since that grade. I love him. So it's great to have that connection. All right. So tell me a, a story about Christian from his youth. Come on, let's let's let it out there. Let it go, man. Let, let's hear a good one. Uh, I really I've always enjoyed Christian. The, the best part of I was thinking of a story when, when we were going to tie and a story popped into my mind. And it was, I think, endemic of, of Christian, the benefits of Christian and the, the native Christian. We were uh, we were playing kickball in the yard at school. Our Lady of Lords. We both went to school. And so we're out there playing kickball and he's on the other team and I get to second base and I'm safe by a mile. And he goes, no, you're out. And I was like, no, I'm safe. No, you're out. And no, I'm safe. And then Christian always reverts to, I'm bigger than you, right? So he's bigger than me. And I'm just this punk little Irish kid. You know, like, that's my family. I, and I got mad and I said something. And I think I hauled off and punched him. And he's like twice my size. And he never, he never swung at me. Christian was never a swinger. He, you just saw his face like, you didn't do what you just did. And he grabbed me and flipped me. And I must have, you know, I did the somersault in the air and landed on the ground. And we're still going to add. And, and here comes Miss Marks, uh -oh. our fifth grade teacher, uh -oh. marching <laughs> towards us. And I think, okay, I'm done. I punched him first. I'm getting in trouble. They're going to send me home from school. My dad's going to come and beat me. My dad was an old school father, you know, and whatever. And literally, she just goes up to Chris, starts yelling at Christian, Sean, go back to class. Why? Because he flipped, he's, because he got judged because he was the bigger person. He shouldn't, no one saw, she, I don't know if she saw me punch him first or she just saw the flip. But this poor guy got yelled at in detention for defending, I mean, just flipping me, much better than him hitting me. Yeah. So that was a story that came up that I thought was funny is, is our relationship, you know, we all widely say, well, you know, we were best of friends with it. We had a great group of friends and we grew up in a different time for sure. Oh, yes. Well, I, and I grew up 10 years earlier than you did then, because I know. <laughs> and it was a really different time there. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely feel like I am a child of the, the 60s for sure. Um, and I was born in the late 50s. But still, um, look, America is still the greatest country on earth, isn't it, Sean, despite the division that we have right now? Well, listen, I'll say, I, I mean, listen, I think a lot of the division is definitely contrived, right? It, they purposely try to divide us. And, it, it, you know, the veteran community is great because we have tremendous representation on all sides of the political equation. And what I will tell you, when you get these veterans in a room, especially if they're smoking cannabis, <laughs> they laugh at the troubles, they laugh at the differences, but they celebrate that 80 to 90 percent of what we experience we're alike and we agree on and instead of focusing on the division we just need a lot more focusing on what brings us together and that is supposed to be freedom and liberty and this cannabis equation we're talking about right the right to protest and sports events and and so forth great discussions i love to talk about but we do need to dial down the notch a bit yeah and 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 you know this as a uh, an army person that it it's easier, although you learned this lesson in fifth grade, it's um, it's much more difficult to walk away from a conflict than to strike out at a conflict. That's my weakness there, uh, Jerry. I don't, <laughs> I don't walk away from conflict. I, I thrive on it and thrive on chaos. And uh, Christian will tell you that. So um, it is it's, it's something I need to work on. But yes. <laughs> That's, that's all right. Hey, um, tell me about the the project you're involved with, the Weed for Warriors project. You've already kind of given me a glimpse of of the camaraderie that our veterans have. And of course, you're all subject to the VA and their draconian um, policy of not offering medical cannabis to veterans, which again, it's like, come on, we, we've got to get into the 21st century at some point, don't we? 
Right. And, and people need to put in context this discussion is what's the substitute, the marijuana substitute you for. And you get away from the risk that a lot, even if River Madness, pale in comparison to the risk of the opiate addiction and the suicide, you know, numbers that are out there. Mm -hmm. And so when you put it in that context, policies like Canada's VA, which gives free weed, if you choose that way to medicate versus the opiates to you every month in the mail, it comes to you. They're a legal nation. (laughs) It is effective. And there's no way in hell that's happening at RVA anytime soon. And a lot of that is it's just a very conservative mindset. It's CYA and, you know, they're controlled by big pharma and the money that's spent on that and everything else. Hey, I got to ask a question about big pharma here because I have a dear friend who is in the industry. He's a vertical, uh, runs a dispensary and, uh, you know, he's very scared of the legalization movement because he sees the almighty dollar and big pharma dominating it. Now, right. as I always say, I only worry about what I can control today, not what the future brings. We can impact the future, but I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, what's your feeling about big pharma in this country? And are they the the big controller that everybody knows they are and how deep are their pockets in our in our democracy republic right yeah to, to fill you on the other background that i have i did work in the wall street community i worked at ernst young and jp morgan in the hedge fund community for many years on the east coast and we had you know rep- board representation seats on these pharma companies we did hostile takeovers with some of these pharma companies you've seen the insides you've been on the insides of these companies we live in a country uh where money is speech And so it shouldn't shock us that people who have money have the loudest voice and they are absolutely going to use it to benefit themselves and the shareholders, which they're major shareholders of to increase their wealth. So none of what is happening should shock us. You either didn't attain a go to history in a civics class and understand how the U.S. government actually works. Um, But the real question, is it good for us? And I, I think it's becoming glaringly no. And so whether we have to revisit Money is speech, the wonderful court case that the Supreme Court bought us. Um, The problem is from an economic standpoint, as I see it, you see a crowding out effect, which is literally money crowds out non-money voices. And so the economic crowding out is never a good thing. They say when the the government comes in to borrow lots of money, it crowds out, you know, uh, other needed people to borrow. Right. So that's the crowding out effect from an economic term is not a good thing. And I think the same thing happens with voice. It crowds out. I mean, let's see what's going on with cannabis on Instagram and Meta and the social media platforms. When we started this in 2015, 2014, um, just officially the Weed for Warriors, it was literally, we had chapters blow up all over the country. And they were listed chapter heads on Instagram dabbing, which is like free base in cannabis. The most, like the worst image you could put out there all the people at normal and mpp were horrified by us right because they wanted to put that very privileged wonder bread view of cannabis out there as they were fighting their fight and meta was very tolerant not only that encouraging of it and you saw social media used as an organizer what i mean by that is that's where the culture went that's where the communities went right and now what's happened because of Everything that happened during Trump and now the government's got to control what Meta says. We've been getting kicked off. They're even nothing on cannabis is allowed on Meta anymore. They've gone to the other string example. You've seen the rise of Twitter in response to that, right? The free speech movement. But that's it. It all covers this whole thing. I mean, it's it's the great thing about cannabis. I think it's a perfect reflection into every part of America's society because it's touching on everything from our constitutional values to liberty to freedom across the board. Right. And Sean, uh, as someone who has used this substance for quite a bit uh, since 1971, um, and I did take 10 years off when my son was born because I wanted to try and see if I a, could do it, raise a child, under not under the influence of anything. Right. And uh, I managed to accomplish that. And he's turned into a great young man, by the way. He's 34, licensed electrician, just got married. Way to go, Gabe. I'm really proud of you. He knows that. But isn't it interesting that this plant medicine brings people from all types of backgrounds together. And over the years, when we're out there breaking the law 
and following our noses around the corner to the alleyway where you run into people that there's no way that are anything like you, okay? And yet you automatically have something in common with them. You're creating an act, you're act, you're creating an act of civil disobedience. You're using a product that people still vilify even to this day. Yet it immediately bonds you with someone. And you know, it's interesting you touch on this, Jerry. I think this is an important point. I, I don't I hope I get through this quick. Sebastian Unger was a writer. He wrote Restrepo. It's that documentary about following a infantry platoon in Afghanistan in the Kurgal Valley, if I'm remembering all the facts correct. Um, he ended up writing in Libya, being embedded in wars all over. He ended up getting killed in Libya. Uh, he wrote a book and he was embedded with these our soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. And he read a book. And what he noticed is people try to make sense of this mental illness that is so prevalent in society today. PTSD, call it whatever you want, right? Yeah. We like to name these things, but it's just a myriad of, of symptoms. And we, we name them different things depending on how they're clustered. Um, and what he saw with the vets is you took them, they were in a platoon in the Korangal Valley or in a platoon in Iraq, you know, supporting the Navy SEALs or whatever, support, frontline, whatever it is. The intensity of the connections of these individuals with each other, the intensity of the events around them creates a bond that he likened to a wolf pack. And then what we do in these vets is we dump them into a society that separates everybody and keeps everyone separate because we don't want any cooperation because that may give rise to something we don't want, right? And that's the disconnect of what's going on. And what's interesting you just touch upon is the community. And so what Weed Warriors got famous for when we started was chapter meetings. Every place we had a chapter every 30 days was our apartment to get vets together, literally. But, you know, Mark would go literally slaughter a pig. He's my partner uh, at one of our vets' house. We'd rotisserate at the chapter. Everyone would bring potluck together, bring stuff together, and we'd smoke, have a lot of free weed there. And everyone would leave with a bag of free weed. And this happened in California because... Prop 215 at the time said you could grow if you had patience. Right. So every chapter meeting, growers in the community would come and say, hey, here's a half a pound of my new stuff. Here's a pound. Here's a couple ounces. I don't have much more. We didn't care, right? Oh, I took, here's some RSO I made off my grow, came it, and we divided it up in bags and we gave it out to all the veterans. That's what we became famous for. And what they got in return, when they got arrested, 100 vets were showing up at the jail saying, he's growing for us. And the judge would go, booted, kicked out. Done. It was a wonderful no government involvement, free market of the community coming together. And so this always raises the question, is it the cannabis that heals or is it the community that's healing? And it's my view after many decades of very intense observation of a tremendous number of anecdotal examples, yep. that's the community. And that's what we're lacking in our society today is the community. They're keeping us divided on purpose. And that's what we talked about on first and cannabis bought people together because right. you immediately understood a shared value concept where trust was built and that trust built everything else. You know, it's an interesting observation I've had. I've lived in the literally very bad areas in Central America. I've lived, you know, I was poor living in San Francisco, going to school in LA and all this stuff and living in Panama and all of it. And I've lived in very affluent communities in New Canaan. And one thing I will tell you, People are much happier in the poorer communities, even if they're miserable without money. Why? Because they depend on each other. They depend on the connections that they must forge to survive. And that is something when you live behind your gates in your community in places like New Canaan or Greenwich, Connecticut, you don't have. You're surrounded by a bunch of yes people who want your money. Yeah, it's it's interesting. That's a great observation. Uh, and um, I love I love hearing this because it, it does kind of go to what uh, drives me to keep this thing going because the anecdotal evidence of the impact that this plant has had on people's lives is so overwhelming. And then you get the science and the research that continues to evolve once we start loosening up some more of the, the laws that are out there that control the money that is the, the speech. Is that what you said? Money is speech? Money is talk? Is, yeah. yeah. That's what the Supreme Court told us. Yeah. So I I haven't quite figured that one out because I do make a lot of uh, talking. I do a lot of talking. <laughs> well, but and, you know, the, the other side of that has never come this way. Let's just say. <laughs> well, hey, right. And, and we're talking about for-profit media, right? Uh, yeah. I remember yes. a day, the 70s. I remember the discussion about the now un-PC term, Chinese wall, you're not supposed to say, right? Mm -hmm. Well, something that was 
lauded was love. You know, you had this wall between the news organization that was a social responsibility and the advertising dollars that collapsed in the 80s, right? It was the Reagan revolution, privatize everything, get rid of government. The almighty invisible hand will guide everything. True, but not true all the time, right? And so what we're dealing with is, is there, it's perspectives. And there's a lot of lack of perspectives at the table that I've seen both in government and when policy is discussed. When sports is discussed, who cares? It's sports. It's not relevant to the, the policy for Jermaine's discussion, right? Right, that's we'll right. Drug policy and jailing people and who should pay taxes and who shouldn't and how much. You want everyone's perspective. And if money crowds out perspective, then you're only getting a very small slice of perspective, the billionaire class, money class. And now we end up being an oligarchy effectively, even if people don't want to believe it. And that's not sustainable. And then what happens? Everyone's angry. They, and then that's when the Civil War comes. And that's the road we're going on. If people don't want to believe it, you're a delusion. No, and it, and it's here. Um, yeah. and, and you're right. The role that media has played in that, and of course, people love to vilify the media, but what happened, and you mentioned social media already, and it kind of goes to where we're going as far as a, a new company goes. Um, Congress gave the keys to the asylum to self-police the social media community. They basically said, go ahead. Well, free speech. Go ahead, Facebook. Go ahead, uh, Google. Go ahead. We're going to protect you. We're going to protect you. Not recognizing the fact that the FCC existed to protect the airwaves and to put standards and practices in place that every commercial television and radio station still has to abide by. But nobody it's watches. Very unfair competitive structure between the two. But nobody watches over the air information anymore. It's all on your phone that we opt in for, you know, the, the airwaves are no, I teach at the college they, level. I, I ask kids, when was the last time you listened to a radio? Oh, I do it in the car. The and I go, no, 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 not in the car, in your house. Do you even own a radio? And of course they don't. I said, well, what would happen if somehow, some way the electric grid blew up, you didn't have to, you couldn't charge your phone. How are you going to get information? And that's why I've always said radio will always survive as a medium because it's still broadcast over the air, but nobody has a radio anymore, you know? So it's one of those weird things, but uh, uh, Congress gave the keys to the asylum to the social media companies. And that's one of the reasons why our uh, content now, I very, I'm very careful about what goes in front of the camera and of course, we're doing news and we're educating the public. So we do, you know, hide behind that or say, this is what we do. We're telling you what's going on in each individual state that has different rules and regulations. And we're now creating our own network of distribution for the industry because we can do that. And 100%. Yeah. And, and that, that, that is so important. You know, I just do one anecdote. Um, I remember a discussion while working in the hedge fund world about asset, the uh, information being the la last asset that isn't commoditized. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you touch on it, it's about control. What you end up seeing is it, everything ends up being controlled by the political mechanism, which is a conglomeration of individual interest, right? Or corporate interest. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's CNBC or CBE, you know, what, what MSM or, you know, Fox, it, it's just two sides, two wings right. of the same bird. Right. And, you know, the democratization of information is what's happening with these podcasts and coming together. And yep. It's needed. But now, how do you, there's, as you said, there's nothing perfect. There's benefits and there's negatives. How do you deal with that? There's no boundaries. There's no boundaries. And the consumer has the choice of what they watch, when they watch, how they consume their, their media, their information. And it can just um, reinforce what they already believe. It's not only and the algorithms do that, not only reinforcement what they believe, but also the, what, you know, the, the selection of emotion to outrage. I mean, that's a, we had a huge social media presence early on. Huge. Yeah. Um, not necessarily just numbers. I mean, we were at 50, you know, six figures in Facebook at one point. We were there on, you know, close to that on Instagram back when it was still 2014. And we were getting huge engagement numbers on a very controversial talk of pressing the issue. Right. And it really comes to outrage, outrage sold. And, and that was the problem. So it's not only just reinforcing your own belief, but then making everyone pissed off, which is not a good combination. No, no. But um, it's interesting. One thing that will always drive 
eyeballs, interest, traffic is a conflict. It yes. is, right? It, it, you're, you say A, I say B, they say C, you say D, <clears throat> and everybody likes that part. That's what makes sports radio so much fun. A, right. you're not talking about real world, you're, for the most part. Um, you're talking about who you think is going to win um, or, or how they might play. And that's then, consequential in the real world. Other than being pissed, your team lost, like the Yankees are losing. That's making me and, mad. <laughs> and and you know what? As a lifelong Boston sports fan, I, okay, I think you know where I'm going with this. I actually was pulling for the Yankees this time, which is probably one of the reasons why they're down. I get actually communicated for saying this. I don't know. I better be careful. No, no, no. It's okay. Look, I'm comfortable with it because the Red Sox have won more, more World Series in the 21st century than the Yankees have. So I can live with that, okay? Because I couldn't live in the 20th century when I grew up with all the Yankees fans and all they could do was throw it in, in the Boston Red Sox faces, you know? Um, Fair enough. But that's the beauty. It's the beauty of sports, too. It's another one of those things that you can have in common with your neighbor who has, you know, a different religion, a different skin color, a different set of values. And yet you bond over the fact that you're both fans of that geographic community's sports teams. And then you actually talk to each other and you learn you have so much more in common and the political differences don't seem as big because you understand those political differences then are complex and deep and you don't necessarily disagree. It's just how it manifests differently. Yeah, it's and exactly. It's the connections that make that we keep coming back to this, right? Same issue. Right. That's right. Well, Sean Kiernan, I know I can talk to you for hours. Okay, that's for sure. And uh, and I've enjoyed even the short amount that we we've chatted. Um, I'm thrilled that you've agreed to come on to our 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 live show um, um, next Monday. I think I'm going to date this a little bit because I'm probably going to release it on Thursday this week, which is only two days away. Um, so it gives me something to do over the next few days. And uh, But I so appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day uh, to join us here. Uh, and more importantly, uh, commit to the, the open discussion we're going to have on our live special on Monday, November 5th, the election eve live discussion about the role cannabis has played in the political presidential race of 2024. I have lived to hear a president of the United States actually use the word. Now he used marijuana, not cannabis, but you know what? I'm going to give him a, a pass on that because he's older than me. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and I do love how Kamala talks about it because she says no one should be smoking weed. And it's like, Wow, that's awesome to hear a vice president of the United States say those things. And, and as far as the other side, just to balance this a little bit, I, I'm going to give him some credit because he used cannabis uh, to swing some people in his home state of Florida. Amendment and, three, question three, yeah, amendment three. Question three, and go against the governor of that state, who is, I'm glad that he didn't win the nomination, even though I wasn't thrilled that Trump is back in our news, our news again. But that's, again, where I live and my impact, my, my own feelings. But we'll get more into this, I think, on Monday Night Live, which will be a lot of fun. So, Sean Kiernan, first of all, how do people find out about the Weed for Warriors project? I'm going to guess Google finds you because I have. Google finds us. Uh, Web page, WFWproject.org, Whiskey, Foss Talk, Whiskey, uh, Project.org, or social media, Weed for Warriors on Instagram is our, our most active site every met as a disaster got suspended so you can find us on instagram you know what that's wrong i'm sorry this is one of the reasons we, we had our account deleted so much oh. wrong but listen our government has said that private companies have a right to censor anything they want on their platform now my question is even if it's at the behest of the government telling them to censor it that's where i got but you know what i'm not a lawyer my daughter just graduated Pothead's daughter just graduated UCLA. She's going to law school. So love that. Be a better love parent. That. And by the way, whenever anybody asks me about the best investment in the cannabis space, I go invest in a good law firm because they're going to win no matter what happens. I've told uh, one of the lawyers at MedMen the day he got his, I said, sell this stuff as quickly as possible. I'm on record saying this thing's not going to work out. We can talk about that more. Big fan of legalization, a lot of great things, but there's some things that need to be fixed. That's right. Absolutely. That's Sean Kiernan from the Weed for Warriors Project. I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of PCM. We'll have more of cannabis coast to coast news as we continue here on PCM TV. We are pro cannabis media. 
I think I messed up. Did you know there's a place that covers all the cannabis news you need? Welcome to Pro Cannabis Media, your go-to for all things cannabis. PCM is the CNBC of weed, bringing you the latest news and talk shows with a twist. We've got 16 state correspondents and multimedia journalists from around the U.S. and Canada. Hey everybody, it's Brandon Jones with Be Green Distribution with the Missouri Cannabis Report. I'm Karen Black from Greenfinger Consulting with the Arizona Cannabis Report. I'm Amy Carter from Michigan Weedsters. Andrew Berenger here reporting from Washington, D.C. I'm Stevie Fazy with the Canadian Talk of the Week. It all started back in 2018 when founder Jimmy Young kicked off the In the Weeds podcast. His mission? documenting the fight to end cannabis prohibition. Fast forward to today and we've got Cannabis Coast to Coast with Elena Pinto, delivering the nation's only TV-style cannabis news show. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Cannabis Coast to Coast News, Pro Cannabis Media's weekly roundup of the news from the industry. I'm Elena Pinto. As of August 2024, PCM has racked up over 1.2 million views and 14.5 million impressions on our YouTube channel. With 15,000 subscribers and growing, our reach is spreading like wildfire. PCM's website, YouTube, Rumble, Discord, Roku, Twitch, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and even our very own PCM TV app. Get your cannabis news fix with Pro Cannabis Media. We're here to keep you informed and entertained. Stay tuned and stay lifted.